that's made my day, that is. <laughs> Thanks, Felix. Um, no, I would encourage you, just as, as Felix has said, the prayer meeting tonight, 8 till 9, uh, yeah, really going to be good to press in into, uh, of course, kind of prayer points uh, related to sort of uh, make sort of passion and mission into Japan and what that looks like, but just outlining a bit more practically kind of what, what does... Uh, support look like uh, within our church family for her and and what we're going to be doing over the coming kind of months just to keep it sort of top of mind and 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 being very specific and intentional in terms of how we can really support her of course in prayer but also practically and financially and uh, in in those areas as uh, as well so, Father's Day today, um, Felix was getting a bit worried because I was, qu- I was getting, it was getting quite late, but I did actually have a lion today. I was able to have a lion, you know, I was treated very well. I was treated very well. So kudos to my wife and my three, three children for, for that. I was treated, I put that on record, uh, I was treated very well between the hours of, of 8 till 10.30, very, very well. And, uh, you know, I, I've... Um, I've been a dad now for, for, for nearly 10 years and, you know, still a newbie, still a newbie, I'm sure. I can see some wry smiles out there as if to say, you know, you've got it coming. You know, oh, you think those first 10 years were tough. You've got it coming. Uh, I'm fully aware. I know. I know. But, um, you know, there, as, as I kind of was reflecting around kind of Father's Day and, and what to bring today, you know, th- there's, there's, there's been sentences, uh, there's been phrases that I thought you would never have to utter or say, that you would never have to actually articulate, like, don't jump out of the window naked and run down the road, or don't get a lipstick and smear it all over your body, or don't, no, don't throw those scissors at your brother's head. Like, you know, there's, 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 there's sort of construction of words that I never thought you'd have to put them together, but I've only found out now as a parent that you, that you certainly do. And so, and I think as I reflect, and, you know, still admittedly, you know, very much a newbie, but over, over, over 10 years of certain sentences and phrases that I've, I've said, and, you know, I, let, let's be honest, shouted at times, um, more common and more frequently than others. And as I started to kind of pray into it and see what God wanted to kind of be saying today, that actually some of these do tell us a lot about the personhood of God the Father and of, of God as our Father and the characteristics. And I believe kind of when we think about that relationship as God as our Father, us as God's child, what that kind of looks like and how that can be very much uh, demonstrated by some of our uh, earthly interactions between parents and, and children. So there's five in total. So number one is this. Get that out of your mouth. Get that out of your mouth. Now, bear with me. You're probably thinking, where am I going to go with this? But get that out of your mouth. And certainly when, I, when they were younger, it was said more so than I hope it is said now. But, you know, as a, as a, as a toddler and as a, as a one-year-old, everything, of course, goes in the mouth. Everything gets, wants to get bitten and chewed. And for whatever reason, for our kids, it was always the TV remote. Always the TV remote that went straight in the mouth. And straight away, you know, you would say as a parent, no, 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 get it out of your mouth, give it back to me, give it back, no, 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 no. And in their minds, they're seeing something, what is getting taken away from them is what is going to give them, for whatever reason, joy and pleasure that putting this in their mouth. And all they see is their dad, their mum saying no. But there's nothing inherently wrong with the TV remote. It does and serves a purpose when you use it properly. And so when we're really saying no, it's very much a not yet. Because you can't use it properly. You don't know what to do with it. All you're going to do is put it in your mouth. And so when I think of sometimes our prayer life, of where we think it's unanswered prayer, God being silent, God saying no... When it comes to opportunity, praying for a door to open, praying for blessing, praying for breakthrough, it could very much be, an, you know, certainly not making a generalisation for all prayers, but it can be a very much a clear sense of not yet. 
Because if we use this analogy, if, we, if you give it to you now, in terms of your spiritual maturity, in terms of development, in terms of areas that still need to be pruning, I've still got a work to do in you, it would be very much like giving a TV remote to a toddler. Giving that to you now, where you're at right at this moment, it will go in the mouth. And so when the psalmist writes in Psalm 27, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. A prayer to be asking isn't necessarily, why God? Why are you not? Why am I not seeing that blessing or that breakthrough or that door opening? But a better question is, what do you want to do in me and with me in this time? What development, what maturity, what pruning needs to happen? And humbly, in that time, coming before your Father God, waiting patiently, but waiting in confidence that you will see the goodness of God in your life. Being strong, taking heart in the waiting. That God is not taking the TV remote from you, but simply saying, not in the mouth. You know, it, 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 let's, let's sit development, maturity, pruning. What does God want to do with me in this time? So get that out of your mouth is number one. If you are writing this down, are these headings, when you, look, when you look back in maybe a year, two years' time, these are going to be like, what was he going on about here? <laughs> number two. No, it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. This is very much... You know, they're upstairs, Um, my seven, nearly eight-year-old daughter, Lily, you know, burgeoning group of friends, Uh, so-and-so's not going to, said she's never going to play with me before. And in her mind, that is the end of the world. It is completely the end of the world. And I find this really hard, I find it really hard to come with the appropriate, you know, not trivialising, bringing some comfort, because in my mind, in my perspective, I'm like... Girl, in 20 years' time, you're not even going to remember who she is. If, we're, if I'm completely honest, you're not even going to remember who she is. But, but what do we come with as good uh, parents? You come, first of all, with comfort, with affirmation, but also a little bit of perspective, hopefully. That we don't trivialise, we don't patronise, but there is a natural inclination to bring comfort, even in, 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 in her mind, and it is very big, but from our vantage point and perspective, it is very, very small. But how can we, in her age, how can we, in a good way, provide that perspective? We can't expect her to kind of have a full appreciation of what the next 10, 20 years is going to bring. We can't expect her to have an appreciation that the, the stresses and the, the worries that she has in her mind at the moment are going to be insignificant and minor in comparison to sort of what a 27 or 37 year old Lily Hoyles is going to face you know Ecclesiastes brings this out where he where Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says you know he has made God has made everything beautiful in its time he has also set eternity in the hearts of men yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end there's a real similarity when God is like looking at what brings us stress, strain, anxiety. And God, as Paul writes, is the father of all compassion, is the God of all comfort. He comes with comfort, with compassion, like a good father. He comes with reminders of affirmation. But he also desires to bring perspective, that we are people, we are children of God with eternity set in our heart. And although it can be very... it is difficult and nearly and impossible to kind of fully fathom and understand what God has done from beginning to end like any loving father he desires to bring that perspective in our view and in our and how we understand current day problems challenges strains and worries that we affirm that we are children of God with eternity set in our hearts, that we engage with complex problems of today in the right way, but in the right perspective. And that is for God to bring, hopefully, 
over time a greater perspective of what that actually means, a greater perspective of what he has done from beginning to end, of what eternity in our heart actually means. But as we get a greater perspective of eternity in our hearts, that we get a greater understanding of priority, of actually what matters to God, of what God's priorities and and critical uh, goals and uh, and inclination and motivation is for us as individuals, for us corporately as a church, for, for the wider community. That as God gives us in current day problems, comfort, assurance, perspective, we also get a better understanding of his priority. Of when he's put eternity in our hearts, why? For what reason? For what goal? And that we can understand in small measures what God has begun and what he is intending to do through us individually and corporately as a church. So number two, no, it's not the end of the world. Number three, and this is for for Noah, who's nearly 10, get out of your bedroom. Get out of your bedroom and spend some time with us. Get out of your bedroom. And, you know, this has really been shown over the last couple of years, just that we were made for connection and for fellowship. You know, Adam Adam was seen, God saw Adam and saw it wasn't good for him to be on his own. And the writer in Hebrews says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The last two years, yes, has shown us great use of how we can better use technology in terms of streaming, in terms of Zoom prayer meetings. But ultimately, it's just reinforced the utter need for connection, for fellowship, for as a church to be meeting together here on a Sunday morning in prayer meetings and connect groups throughout the week, to be doing life together. There's the importance, the criticality of fellowship, but also in that fellowship and in that connection for us to spur one another on, to bring encouragement, to get out of our uh, our bedroom, our proverbial bedroom, and and encourage one another and, and not just have in terms of how we engage with our faith, very much a kind of an internal faith, of a kind of a head down, of grappling with questions of what you read in the Bible or what you hear preached, or what you sing about, and, 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 and not surfacing them, not talking about them, where they, where they bring you a bit of challenge, where they bring a bit of seeming contradiction, or they, that you feel actually, how does that play out in terms of other parts of the Bible, or other things I've heard, or what science or what social norms are telling us? That we, as as part of this sort of proverbial getting out of our bedroom, that we do have, and I've certainly experienced it in church, in this church, of a culture of of challenge. That we don't, today, you're sitting around and seeing people, you know, nod their heads and thinking, oh, that sounds good, that sounds good. And you might feel, I'm the only one that, that sounds a bit jarring. That's not my kind of reality. I've got a question there. if you are you know, relatively new to the church, that there is transparency, there is openness to discuss these things. You know, I'm very conscious, especially with Noah now, of not just as he reads parts of the Bible, goes to Sunday school, hears things, he doesn't just accept it as read, nods his head, smiles, but, but interacts with his faith even at a young age. That we, we um, as Peter writes, has a good, we have a good um, reason for the faith that we believe in. That we don't, we don't just internalise it, but we surface it in appropriate ways and appropriate settings to have those, uh, have, have those conversations. But we have that kind of culture of just transparency and challenge, which I've certainly found that we do, but certainly just wanted to give also licence to people that are maybe relatively new to the church, that's, that friends do in connect groups, in, in, in appropriate spaces and conversations. Have that, have that uh, discussion. Because you'll find that our Christian faith can hold up to scrutiny. Our God is big enough to hold up to scrutiny and and, and rigorous debate. Many people have found that to be true. 
have found that to be true. We don't have a fragile faith. We have a strong, strong God, a strong faith, a a strong reason for our faith that holds up to scrutiny. And lastly, getting out of your bedroom also looks around accountability, the importance of having an individual or or a small group of people to be real with, to be open with, to share trials, tribulations, concerns, current current difficulties, to be accountable to one another. You can't be accountable, you know, to um, a YouTube video or a or the God Channel, but accountability is is such a strength of a church family being accountable to one another, again, in in the right and appropriate settings. Number four, hold my hand, hold my hand. And this this comes out in a few different ways. You know, where where they don't, where the children still maybe not conscious of of, of the the danger that is around them, perhaps, in, in a car park. You know, they see kind of park cars just static, but not fully understanding that you know they can still kind of jut out and move quite quickly, or or or, or uh, drive drive very quickly around the car park, and you ask them to hold their hand. But more around times where they themselves are unnecessarily um, uh, afraid. And, you know, so, you know, in a swimming pool and you're asking them to, to jump into the pool and you're there with them. Or to walk into a room full of strange, strange people that they don't know of and you tell, ask them just to hold, hold, hold uh, your hand. And the reason why, then, I believe, when I reflect on uh, Noah, Lily and Piper, when they hold our hand or jump into the pool... It's, it's, it's because there is a distinct parallel and similarity with the level of trust that they have in me and in Lisa. There's then an equal amount of depth of knowledge of who we are and of the relationship they have uh, with us. They trust us because they know us. They trust us because they know us. You know, if there was someone they didn't really know in that swimming pool or in that room asking them to take hold of their hand, they, would, they, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. They would either run away, find someone that they knew, but they wouldn't trust that person. You know, Proverbs uh, says, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Now, that's a great um, promise. You know, trust in your Lord, lean on your understanding, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. But if you don't know who this God is, if if you don't have uh, an appreciation of the, the personhood of Father God, of the promises that he made, it can be very difficult to read that and actually put trust in that in that in that figure. So I'd encourage you around sort of trusting in God. Don't look for areas in the Bible that talk about put trust in God and, 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 and he will make your path straight as such. But dig into, explore who God is. The very reason why we should be putting our trust in him. The steadfast nature that he has shown for millennia, the promises and affirmations that he made and continues to make in our day-to-day lives. Don't look to find sort of a, a greater level of trust. Look for a greater level of relationship, a level of, of understanding of who God is. So when you feel that prodding of, of God asking for trust, trust me in this new venture, in this new path in this this new season of life you're putting your trust in the personhood of God of who he displays himself to be throughout scripture throughout uh, lives and, and corporately through the lives of this church putting trust in the relationship and the understanding that you have of God not necessarily because it's something you know written you know in 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 in, in the book of proverbs but born out of the relationship the understanding that you have of a, of a god who is steadfast 
of a God who is unchangeable, of a God who delivers consistently on what he says he's going to do, of what he promises to do. And lastly, and it's a one more, more frequently as they get older, how much? How much is this going to cost? How much is this going to be? People warn me that as they get older with activities and clubs and so forth, the, 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 the cost does certainly increase. And that seems to be certainly true. How much? How much is this going to cost? And friends, you know, I think we can just thank our Father God in heaven that that question was asked, how much? And we read in, in Corinthians uh, twice in, in chap- 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and chapter 7 that we were bought with a price and the price was paid. And probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John three sixteen, that God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. Friends, that we have a father in heaven who the question was made of how much. And he knew the cost even before the very first verse in the Bible, before the earth was formed, before sin entered the world. He knew the cost, and he still declared that it was a price worth paying. It was a price worth paying. He knew the centuries, the millennia of of, of rejection, of rebellion, of disobedience, of heartache, of pain. And he still declared it's a price worth paying. And individually, he looks at each of us, our lives laid bare before him our own trauma, our own mistakes and failures and challenges, our own pain. And he still individually says, my child, you are the price worth paying. You are worth the price I paid. So we praise and glorify him that we didn't have a father in heaven that said, how much? But said, my child, you are mine. You are valued. You are worth it. So I invite the band up just to lead us in a, in a song where we can just declare our, just our thanks and appreciation that our father in heaven Across, across human history, which is something to marvel at, at the depth of depravity and pain that has been caused over centuries, but also individually, when our ups and downs in our lives of, of intense challenge and pain, that God still declared, it is a price worth paying. It is a price I'm gladly to pay. We are bought with a price for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Because we are his. We have value. We are worth immensely more in his eyes than probably even we see in the mirror. Because we are his children and he is our father. Amen.